Welcome to Chemistry at York. This open educational resource is a joint production of the Department of Chemistry at York College and the Department of Natural Sciences at LaGuardia Community College of the City University of New York. This video is entitled Atomic Theory Number Three, Evolution of Atomic Theory. My name is Emmanuel Chang, and today we're going to learn some chemistry. Hi, my name is Kelly. I like to cook and martial arts. Hi, my name is Vimal, and I like video games. Hi, my name is Tessa, and I like carbon reactions. In the last video, atomic theory number two, we learned that atoms are composed of protons, neutrons, and electrons, subatomic particles. You may wonder how we know about these subatomic particles. After all, atoms are so tiny that you can't see them, can't see them with your eyes, and can't see them even with the most powerful microscope that we have. In this lecture, we'll take a look at several experiments that scientists did during the course of the development of atomic theory by which these scientists discovered characteristics of protons, neutrons, and electrons. What makes these experiments mm, quite amazing is that they did them over a hundred years ago with technology that is, well, that we would consider um, very much out of date um, quite simple and quite rudimentary, and they were able to learn a lot about the fundamental nature of matter. We'll look in detail at three of these experiments. The cathode ray tube used by J.J. Thompson, the oil drop experiment used by R.A. Millikan, and the gold foil experiment used by Ernest Rutherford. There were, of course, many more experiments and many more scientists that contributed to the development of atomic theory. Some of those are shown in the last slide of this presentation. The first experiment that we're going to look at is the cathode ray uh, experiment by J.J. Thompson, which was done in 1897. A cathode ray is made up of what Thompson called electric ions, the identity of which mm, we now know to be the electron. And so a device was used to generate um, a beam of these electric, electric ions or electrons within a vacuum tube. Situated within this tube were these charged plates um, you had a sort of electromagnetic um, apparatus here where you have a positively charged plate and a negatively charged plate. The idea here is actually quite simple. Because the cathode ray was made up of electric ions or negatively charged ions, it would be expected that the positively charged plate would attract those ions and the negatively charged plate would repel those ions. And when he did that experiment, indeed what happened was that the electric ions were drawn towards the positive plate and repelled from the negative plate. And so where here you can see that their trajectory is sort of straight down the middle of the tube, once they pass the charged plates, they're deflected. And using some equations of physics that we're not going to get into in this lecture, the degree to which they were deflected reflects actually the mass to charge ratio of those electric ions or those particles. Some consider this to be the first uh, mass spectrometer using principles that are still in application today. The cathode ray tube experiment contributed to the discovery of the particle that we now know as the electron. 
The second experiment that we're going to talk about is the experiment of Robert Millikan, which was conducted in 1909. This experiment is quite sophisticated. What Millikan studied was oil drops that were electrically charged. It's little tiny oil drops. And so these oil drops were um, produced by a, a mister, an oil sprayed in fine droplets, into this uh, device which contained an x-ray to produce charge on the droplets, and these two plates, positively charged and negatively charged, where the voltage um, could be turned on and off and could also be varied. And so what's ha what would happen if you put an oil drop, there's a little pinhole, right? So these oil drops get produced and because the hole here is very small, even though a whole bunch of oil is produced here, only one drop at a time falls. So what would happen to this oil drop if the voltage on these plates were turned off? Well, what would happen, of course, is that they would fall due to the force of gravity. And the rate uh, at which they fall is something that can be calculated based on the mass of the droplet, the size of the droplet, and the force of gravity. We're not going to calculate that. The calculations are a little bit sophisticated. It's enough that we understand that the droplets will fall. Now, once they receive a charge, you're able to put a force on those droplets, or Millikan was able to put a force on those droplets that opposed the force of gravity. Because the droplets were negatively charged, uh, once the voltage is turned on, those negatively charged droplets would be repelled from the minus plate, negative plate, and attracted to the positive plate. And so what he did was he varied the voltage on these plates such that the electric force pushing the um, droplets towards the positive plate and the gravitational force pulling the droplets downward were exactly balanced. And so the drop droplet, just like the um, laser pointer mm, circle, laser pointer dot um, in the figure, the droplet was suspended without moving in between the plates. In that way, he could find out what voltage was needed to counteract the force of gravity. And using, an, again, a, a number of sophisticated calculations, he was able to calculate the charge on the droplet. Now, the charge on every droplet was somewhat was different, um, but what he found was that every charge on er or the charge on every droplet was a multiple of this number here, 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19th coulombs. And so you can see here 1.6, and then 3.2, which is double 1.6, 4.8, which is triple, and 6.4, which is quadruple. The conclusion or the implication is that 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19th coulombs, that's the smallest or fundamental charge that could be on a droplet. And so that Millikan reason must be the charge on a single electron. And so if the opposing force, the force uh, uh, counteracting gravity was mm, corresponded to a charge of 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19th coulombs, he assumed there was one electron. If it was 3.2, he assumed there were two electrons and 4.8, three electrons, and so on. Using these assumptions, combined with J.J. Thompson's result from the cathode ray tube, he was able to, they were able to deduce, remember what Thompson found was the mass to charge ratio. If you have the mass to charge ratio, and then now you have a charge, you're able to find out the mass of an electron. And the mass of the electron was found it was determined by Thompson to be 9.107 times 10 to the negative 31st kilograms. This is very close to what we know today using much more sophisticated methods.
The first two experiments, uh, Thompson's and Millikan's, um, related to the electron. The next experiment that we are going to look at relates to the nucleus. You will recall from lecture number two, from video number two, that the nucleus contains the positive charge, the protons, as well as neutrons. Right, so the electrons are the negatively charged particles sitting outside of the nucleus. The nucleus is the very small, very dense part of the atom that contains the positive charge. That's what we know today, but that was not um, always something that people knew about atoms as atomic theory was being developed. People had very many different ideas. They knew there were negatively charged particles. They knew there were positively charged particles, but wondered what the configuration of these particles actually is. One model that scientists developed was called the plum pudding model. This plum pudding model actually is often attributed to J.J. Thompson, who discovered the mass to charge ratio of the electron. It turns out, while he was right about the electron, he was not so right about the nucleus. Plum pudding is a very British uh, sort of dessert, not actually much of a pudding. It's more sort of like a soft cake-ish kind of thing, where the, as you can see, these plums, these sort of dark colored fruits, are embedded within uh, the rest of the pudding. And so the plum pudding model assumes that electrons are these negatively charged plums that are embedded in the positively charged pudding. There's another model called the Saturnian model. Um, Saturn, of course, is one of the planets in our solar system and it's famous for having rings. And the Saturnian model and things and models like it say that the nucleus is in the middle and the electrons kind of orbit the nucleus like a ring. Ernest Rutherford in 1913 did an experiment that disproved both of those models and was used to um, develop a new, more accurate model of um, the atom, specifically as regards the nucleus. What Rutherford did is he had a very fine, very thin piece of gold foil that was only a few atoms thick, and some high-speed positively charged particles were passed through um, that piece of foil, basically shot through, shot toward the foil to see what would happen. These uh, positively charged particles we now know are alpha particles, and um, they are essentially equivalent to the nuclei of helium, where you have two protons and two neutrons, um, so therefore positively charged, no electrons. When these um, alpha particles were shot at the gold foil, most of them passed straight through. A few were, and a few were deflected. And so the um, model that was developed was something like this, <clears throat> that reflects not the plum pudding nor the Saturnian model, but the nuclear model we know today. The interpretation of the experiment goes something like this. Most of the atom is actually empty space. You remember the nucleus is about 100,000 times smaller than the electron cloud in a typical atom. And so if one of these positively charged particles passed through the electron cloud, mostly it just went straight through because it was so much more massive. However, if it hit a nucleus, it would bounce back. If it passed close to a nucleus, it would get slightly deflected right, because positive charges will repel positive charges. But most passed through unscathed. A few were slightly deflected, and very, very few were significantly deflected. And so what that demonstrated was that most of the atom was indeed empty space. And in fact, this figure over here exaggerates the number of particles that were deflected. 
Um, in fact, 99% or more of them passed straight through. So those three experiments are just a few of the experiments that contributed to the development of atomic theory. In this slide, you can see some of the um, some of the other experiments, as well as some of the theories that were developed as a result of them. Some of these theories um, and some of these experiments we'll learn more about um, over the course of chemistry at York, and that you may also learn in your general chemistry course. If you have more interest, there are very many very good resources on the internet um, that you can search for and uh, read to learn more about atomic theory. Okay, so this ends um, this video lecture, Atomic Theory number three. We hope you enjoyed it and thank you for watching.